This video is the first part of our series on umbilical cord prolapse and presentation. Here we discuss the revision of their definitions and the urgency of delivery based on our publication in AJOG in 2021. The first issue presented the confusion of their definitions. Traditionally, cord prolapse is defined as the presence of a loop of cord below the external cervical os. As the exposed cord is clinically identifiable, it is also commonly called overt prolapse. When the cord is above the external os but below the fetal presenting part, then it is cord presentation. Another commonly used term is occult cord prolapse, which usually means that a loop of cord is alongside with the fetal presenting part. The term occult is used as the cord is neither outside nor at the cervical os, meaning the condition is not readily identifiable. However, the term prolapse is a misnomer as the cord has not prolapsed out. Both the cord and the fetal presenting part are still above the external os. You may have read from the RCOG guideline that occult cord prolapse is the descent of the cord through the cervix alongside the fetal presenting part. It is an improper description because in a real situation, it is rather impossible for the cord to pass through the surface or still being alongside the presenting part, which has not yet passed through the surface until in the second stage of labor. And if it does happen, it is not occult anymore. Hence, the correct term to describe this condition should be compound cord presentation instead. Why is it important to get the definition right? Cord prolapse is supposed to be more risky than cord presentation, but in fact, this so-called occult prolapse is less severe than the later in terms of progression to genuine cord prolapse, as the fetal presenting part displaces the cord from the cervical os. As such, the misnomer occult prolapse is misleading in the estimation of its risk. Therefore, occult cord prolapse should be replaced by compound cord presentation to accurately reflect the risk of these conditions, which are related to the degree of the descent of the cord. Furthermore, the use of the term overt is rather unnecessary and we dumb them. Another point is that cord prolapse is usually defined with the presence of rupture of membranes, while in cord presentation, the membranes can be ruptured or intact. Although cord prolapse in the presence of rupture of membrane highlights a dangerous condition that requires immediate intervention, it does not cover cases where the cord has passed through the surface but remains contained in an intact amniotic sac herniated into the vagina. The later condition is more common in preterm gestation or cervical incompetence. Although the membranes are intact, compression between the surface and the fetal part may still occur during uterine contractions. Upon rupture of the membranes, the cord becomes unprotected in the vagina or may even be flushed out of the vagina. In such cases, the fetal risk is higher than that of cord presentation or compound cord presentation. Hence, we redefine and reclassify cord prolapse, cord presentation, and compound cord presentation with rupture or intact membranes. This classification covers all the possible conditions and more accurately reflects their risk. The second issue concerns the urgency of delivery. The mainstay of treatment for cord prolapse is urgent delivery, which means cesarean delivery in most cases, unless vaginal delivery is imminent. The RCOG guideline states that delivery should be achieved within 30 minutes. However, such recommendation is not grounded on good evidence, as it also states that there is a poor correlation between decision to delivery interval and the umbilical cord pH. Previous studies have failed to show the correlation between delivery time and the umbilical cord pH because their sample sizes are usually small. They did not stratify the fetal heart rate conditions, and they only correlate with the decision to delivery interval. In fact, fetal heart rate may or may not be abnormal during cord prolapse, depending on whether there is cord compression or vasoconstriction. When there is cord compression, the fetal heart rate undergoes its decelerations as a result of barrel reflex. The decelerations are usually reversible when the compression is relieved, usually in relation to uterine relaxation. Hence, the risk of persistent fetal hypoxia is low. On the other hand, if there is persistent cord compression or vasoconstriction, persistent fetal hypoxia may result in fetal bradycardia. Hence, we have recently conducted a retrospective study of 114 cases of cord prolapse, 
30% have persistent bradycardia, 26% have recurrent decelerations, and 44% had a normal fetal heart rate pattern. In the group of fetuses with persistent bradycardia, their umbilical cord pH was significantly lower than the other two groups. The proportion of these cases with severe acidosis with pH less than 7 is as high as 27%. The base excess were also significantly lower, even though they were delivered more quickly. Furthermore, we also show that the umbilical cord pH drops significantly with bradycardia to delivery interval instead of decision to delivery interval. This is understandable as the actual onset of hypoxia starts at the time of bradycardia, not the time when a clinician makes the decision. That is also why previous studies could not show any correlation using decision to delivery interval. Therefore, this group of fetuses should be delivered as soon as possible and the 30-minute rule is rather loose to ensure fetal safety. On the other hand, in the group with recurrent decelerations or normal CTG, the umbilical cord arterial pH remained normal. Hence, for these two groups, the need of crash delivery is low. A decision to delivery interval within 30 minutes is acceptable. Meanwhile, preventing further cord prolapse, close fetal monitoring, and optimization of maternal conditions before cesarean delivery are the suitable managements. Please also watch the second part of our series, where we will discuss the effectiveness, pros and cons of different maneuvers in relieving cord compression and the potential benefits of tocolysis. Thank you for watching. To learn more about the techniques and management of emergency obstetrics, please visit our SOFI website.